While technology in general continues to advance rapidly, the hype around ag tech has really died down. What endures are those technologies that have proven their value on the farm. I think everyone in general is more, bring me something that's been proven for a while and then we'll talk, including us. And we're in the ag tech space. Corey Willness made his first appearance on the show almost four years ago, episode 211, and his perspective on ag tech at that time was so spot on, the interview could have easily been done today despite huge changes to the industry. He rejoins the podcast today to talk about the evolution of precision ag with his co-founder, Derek Massey. We're going to see higher resolution of variable rate, so we're going to be managing the field in smaller zones, and we're going to have better information about what nutrients are there to optimize profit based on all those factors. Not only will this episode give you a much better understanding of precision ag, it's also going to give you a model for what a successful ag tech company looks like today and going forward. Scalability is great, but it just kind of happens almost like a staircase, right? Like it's incremental and it's very difficult to gain a service provider or farmer's trust just with a tech tool. Corey Wilness and Derek Massey on today's Future of Agriculture podcast. Hello, fellow ag nerd. Thank you so much for joining me. My name is Tim Hamrich, and every week you and I get to hear from the founders, farmers, innovators, and investors, the people shaping the future of the ag industry. Uh, today's episode features Corey Wilness and Derek Massey of Croptimistic Technology, the makers of Swap Maps. And not only do we have a great episode with those two guys, but they are also the quarterly presenting sponsor this quarter. Because when you know more, you grow more. Swap Maps variable rate technology helps you understand the why of field variability and how to better manage it. Understanding soils is the core of a successful fertility program, and Swap Maps allows you to map, measure, and better manage your soils using data that accurately delineates areas with similar fertilizer response characteristics. Turn your data into actionable value with Swap Maps. They are your trusted variable rate provider on millions of acres with a 98% retention rate. Unheard of in ag tech. Swap Maps, they do variable rate right. Visit swapmaps.com to book a consultation or to learn more. Again, that's just swapmaps.com. We'll make sure we link that in the show notes as well. I've known Corey and been familiar with the Swap Maps team for a long time now, ever since he was a guest back on episode 211. And I'm really proud to host their Swap Agronomy podcast. So you can check that one out if you're looking for another ag tech podcast to listen to. Thank you again to Swap Maps for supporting ag innovation and the future of Agriculture podcast. All right, back to today's featured conversation with Corey Wilness and Derek Massey. Corey and Derek are the co-founders of Croptimistic Technology, which are the makers of SWAT maps. SWAT stands for Soil, Water, and Topography. And now for you non-agronomists who might be in the audience listening to this, and if some of that sounds confusing, I'll try to give you a really, really basic kind of one-on-one version. Uh, as you probably know, farmers are increasingly using the types of equipment that allow them to vary the rate at which they apply things like seed, fertilizer, and chemical. Uh, this ability to account for different conditions within the same field allows them to be more profitable and to be more sustainable and really is the basis for what we call precision agriculture. Uh, but in order to know what rates to use and where to use them, they have to have a really good understanding of the field. And that's what SWAT maps gives them. In order to generate these SWAT maps, an agronomist or consultant will literally drive over the field with a SWAT box to collect that data and generate these soil water and topography or SWAT maps for variable rate prescriptions. Other companies might use things like satellite or yield data to sort of try to back into this, uh, but it doesn't actually tell the farmer the underlying soil factors that are driving those outcomes. So uh, I again, I think that's a really crude and, and, and basic description, but I hope it helps get everyone up to speed because this is a really great episode, even if you're not an agronomist or, or somebody using precision ag. Uh, definitely go check out episode 211 with Corey to learn more about the basics of SWAT. Swap maps. I actually just re-listened to that episode this week and Corey's perspectives that he shared nearly four years ago on ag tech hold up really as well as any episode I've ever done. Uh, the guy really knows his stuff and this is another great episode today. Corey is the CEO of Croptimistic and Derek is the CTO. Uh, they've been working together on building precision ag tools for about 20 years together. 
Corey said, he's the hustler and Derek's the hacker, which I really liked. Uh, Derek's an electrical engineer and software developer. His dad was a farmer and Corey approached him in the early 2000s to start building software together. At that time, Corey was an independent crop consultant and the owner of Crop Pro Consulting, which is a company he still owns today that does agronomic consulting in Western Canada. It's through these early experiences of building these digital tools that Corey and his fellow agronomists on his team could use that led them to building a company to sell tested and proven technology that they were already using in the field. We talk about many things in this episode, uh, from the evolution of precision agriculture to building a profitable and lasting company in ag tech, uh, to why after many years they decided to take on an investor in 2021, and what the future might look like for precision agriculture and ag tech more generally. Enjoy this conversation. I'm going to drop you in here where Corey's reflecting on those early days and what ultimately led to swap maps and the formation of Croptimistic Technology. Yeah, well, starting out in like crop consulting services, it's quite a bit different than what people would call data management. When you're building out services, there's a logistic side to what you do. There's a reporting side and at that point in time in 2003, there really wasn't any software out there. Uh, so lots of things were very manual or you're doing it on spreadsheets and stuff. And of course, it's just not professional. It's not, you know, efficient. So I got Derek to do some work for me and he was really fast. And so it was a very good way to invest money in the future of the consulting business. So that's kind of how we got started. And yeah, I would say for the first Five years, it was only crop consulting software. There was nothing related to what we've evolved to, which is a precision ag services business today. I believe in 2008, we started into the precision ag services. And so we, Derek built out the fundamentals of that, lots of it while he was actually in Australia for a period of time, which was kind of neat. And that also helped with our evolution because we've been remotely working as a team and the business evolved as a remotely working team right from the beginning day. So that's also influenced heavily how the software works and, you know, amongst people. And, and Derek, so at 2008, were you already, had you already been a full-time employee uh, of the company for some time? No, I wasn't a full-time employee till 2013, I believe. But at that time in 2010, 2011, I was probably working half-time. And you know, in the early days, what did you think about this, Derek? I mean, was this just like a fun side project for you? Did did you see it going to uh, where it is today? Yeah, I'd say both. It was a fun side project. It was stuff that I knew how to do and could make a big difference for Corey and what in just his efficiency. But um, you could see that it might have potential someday as well. So it was really good when we finally got to the point where you can make the jump to full time. And, and when you guys created the swap box, th there were other sort of, you know, uh, EC sensors out there. Were, were people using EC sensors for this purpose before the swap box? Um, no. I mean, we patented the swap maps process, which stands for soil, water, and topography. And I mean, in the early days when we started soil mapping, and there's, there'll be thousands of these tools out there across the world used to generate like an electrical conductivity map, we'll call it that. Um, but it was obvious to us that <clears throat> that's not good enough because you could have a hill and a depression with low EC, you could have a hill or a depression with high EC in the same field. So the real question was why? Why are these differences there? So that's when we built in our topography and our water modeling, right? And so now the modules, the help to clear up those questions. And then they'll redefine things into zones that make sense. So nobody else is really making a swap map. There might be people think that they're claiming something that's close, but the honest truth is nobody's doing anything similar to this. So that's the key thing. When the data comes in from the swap box, then it goes into our proprietary module that builds all these individual layers and people can use them for drainage or those types of things too, right? It's modeling all this, how the water works in the fields and where it sits and where it doesn't. And, and so when they're done, they basically get a proprietary map and that's been very popular and very easy to move to other parts of the world. And even though the soils could be radically different, their climate can be radically different. Like the process of defining 
soil, water, and topography variability is actually quite consistent. So, yeah, it's been a very popular map. It's very, very difficult to make. So that's sort of probably been where, you know, our moat has been. And the early users, Corey, were that, was that basically you and your employees kind of coming up with these ideas of where you needed to take the platform next? Yeah, it was all like internal. In other words, we, we built a system for our business and the way that we needed to do things. And then there did come a point when we started being resellers of it. Uh, so then you do get different perspectives of, you know, how people want to do things. And like now I believe we're up to probably like 20 different soil test labs that can import data or something like that. So, yeah, over time it, it has evolved into being, you know, used in so many different geographies that those people influence what gets built as well. But yeah, in the early days, it's always been internal. And I think one of the strengths of what we have built is that we still have a very large footprint of boots on the ground consulting here in Western Canada. Like we have about 40 staff that still use the software every day. And so, I mean, that's really good too, because if there's bugs or any issues with stuff, well, I mean, we need it to work too. So that's almost an advantage to all our, our partners that use it is that, you know, they know that we can't be down either. Like it has to work for us. So. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder why, I mean, I have a hunch why, but it's it's surprising to me that we don't see more of the the tech companies truly partnering, you know, with boots on the ground agronomists. And I don't mean partnership in the in the press release sense, but in the actual like we're going to actually have, you know, skin in the game on this and grow it together type sense. It's surprising to me we don't see more of that. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's all about scalability, right? Of course, in the tech industry, everyone wants SaaS software as a service, and that's incredibly scalable. And that's nice, but I think the agriculture has kind of proven that scalability is great, but it just kind of happens almost like a staircase, right? Like it's incremental and it's very difficult to gain a service provider or farmer's trust just with a tech tool. You know, like it has to come from somewhere, and that sort of boots on the ground approach is still the bridge for that and i think that's what's made us successful is that we've never gone away from that yeah we're bringing you tech but you don't really have to know much about it that's our job like we'll make the tech work for you you just you're you're investing in something here it's but it's more of a service than it is a pure tech solution so i mean most investors don't want to do that however that's probably going to change well, let, let's go back to that first customer. You know, how, how did that first customer come along uh, for the uh, crop records software? Yeah, I think similar to uh, what we do today. It's more or less just finding like-minded service providers that are out there in the market. They could be ag retailers, could be just independent consulting companies, you know, and everybody needs something. Everybody needs a platform to run on. So... Yeah, more or less, it's just getting out and touched base with mostly people here in Western Canada that became users. And you referred to like-minded service providers. Can you define that a little bit about what, what about them is like-minded uh, to you all? Um, like-minded meaning like how people do business with the farmer, right? So uh, independent consulting industry all really does business the same way. It's kind of like if you think of how a lawyer does business or an accountant does business, like you can go from one to another and they're very similar in how they operate with the customer, like what their service looks like. So I would say ag retailers become a little less like-minded. Like a fee-for-service consultant has to make all the revenue off the client. It's an unbiased, independent, sort of like a retainer service where a service provider works for the farmer right? Meets the needs of the farmer, whether that's like a crop scouting service or soil sampling and variable rate service, whatever that is, they, they're in business with the customer. Whereas with ag retailers, it, it kind of can be spun off a bit, right? Like they'll offer some free services if you're buying products with them. So like-minded to me, it, it's mostly that independent consulting style business operations where you're contracted to the customer to provide a specific set of services for the year. And uh, I, I want to get to the tech part of it here in just a minute. But, but Corey, one more follow-up question for you. 
you, know, you talked about how important having those boots on the ground and, and being a crop consultant has been to the growth of the company. But now that the company's scaling, you know, you mentioned international since 2018, it's scaling international. How do you maintain that advantage, but still grow at sort of a uh, more of a, a tech scale? Well, the simple answer is, I always say it's 50% technology and 50% agronomy. So, I mean, I really feel like our part is uh, trying to make sure the technology works for that person in the new area. And quite often you get to a new area, there's things that are going to need to be tweaked, right? Like just the way that they do things like Australia works in hectares. Well, then you got to make sure everything works in hectares and, you know, they're paddocks and not fields. And so like, there's lots of things that you wouldn't normally think of that you kind of need to make work for the markets when you get there. And then on the agronomic side, we almost completely stay out of it. We provide a lot of like what's worked in other areas and how you, and the general fundamentals of agronomy aren't really any different in different areas, the fundamentals. So I think that's probably the limit to what our influence would be on that. But really when it comes down to it, we're just like the side brand on the consultant's truck or business. We're not the primary brand. If it's John's consulting in Nebraska, John just goes about doing his business and he's offering now a swap maps precision ag service. So we don't try and steal the thunder away from the existing person's brand. We just try and add to that brand and make sure from a technology perspective, we're backing them 100% that our products work, our hardware is really good, the fees are sustainable, and all those types of things. And I know for you all, being around for decades now and, and in the technology game for well over a decade, you all hadn't raised money until uh, I think 2021. And so talk about that decision to do so and uh, what that represented as a, a milestone for the company. Yeah, well, I guess, I mean, you can see that we were a bootstrapped company and really Derek and I were, we always knew in our mind that we would at some point in time scale to grow the company. But neither of us were interested in doing that until we felt like the timing was right. And the timing needs to be right for, for your product, right? Your software and your hardware and your business model and everything, as well as, uh, you know, timing in the market. Is this the right time to go to market? You know, will people buy? So we, we probably went too late. A lot of our competitors went before us, but we didn't want to go into the market and fail. So, yeah, when we took our first investors, Forge Capital, up here in Canada, based in Calgary, it was perfect timing for us. Um, we needed to take the next step. We needed some growth capital to start building out our technology um, and ex expanding into international markets. And it's been, you know, very successful. It's worked out great for us. So our growth is, I would say, matched with our ability to look after it. Um, and a lot of companies, I think they try and grow too fast and then you got to keep burning cash, burning cash to try and keep up to it all and make it all happen. But we're not doing that this year. We require any cash, like we're, the company is profitable. So um, we, we only take growth company when it's time to build something new or expand to something better. And, you know, now is not the time for that. And the capital markets, it's nice that we don't have to go back. Yeah, it's been very strategic. Let's call it that. Absolutely. Well, uh, Derek, I, I kind of mentioned that as a milestone. I know that was somewhat recently, just a couple of years ago. But uh, what other milestones, at least from a tech standpoint, as you think back on this this journey, uh, what stands out as important kind of breakthroughs or milestones with developing the technology? Uh, some major milestones were our first uh, mobile app for farmers um, on the Crop Records platform originally, now called SWAT Records. And then a little bit after that, we built our first SWAT maps through our software. They had kind of put together a manual process of building them. But once we automated that, we were able to really increase our capacity. Then another major product was our SWAT box. When we did our first automatic SWAT box and the vehicle mount um, and the upload to the cloud. And then the most recent probably would be our SWAT camps product for generating crop and weed maps and uh, just this year plant stand maps for the field. 
And the SWAT cam, I mean, that's simply a, it's a camera that mounts to a, a piece of machinery as it's going through the field and then the uh, the software to uh, to process all that data. Is that right? Yeah, it mounts to a sprayer. So, it, I mean, it mounts to sprayer booms, one on each side of a sprayer boom. Love that. And yeah, I mean, and on that note, what, what are some of those those problems that uh, agronomists and growers are still wrestling with that, you know, you think a solution could be developed for anything come to mind? I think there's still a lot of opportunity in the soil test and soil measurement area. The technologies for knowing what's in the soil aren't that accurate and aren't that scalable. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there to have better sensors and from large data sets also to be better at predicting and finding changes year over year. Yeah, my comments would be that um, there's a lot of opportunity out there for new technology. Um, we have 18 research projects going on and mostly in Canada right now. And a lot of these are very early days of testing things that Will they have promise? Will they not? And someone needs to work with researchers usually, and you might spend 50 grand and get it matched with a grant to a university on a PhD project or something, you know. So you're building capacity throughout the country with people and you learn from them, you develop relationships and maybe only 25% of these things turn into something where you say, this has big potential to solve this problem for either our software platform or a farmer or an agronomist. And we don't like sort of pigeonhole who needs to get a problem solved. And people always treat it like it's the end user that needs a problem solved. But we're trying to scale a precision egg services company. And sort of like Derek said before, like if you need half the amount of people and you could reduce your vehicle fleet in half and get better data at a lower cost, is that a solution? Absolutely, it's a solution, right? So being in this game, we understand that, you know, a lot of the scalability that's coming doesn't necessarily mean it's like some tool a farmer needs. A lot of this is just farmers want to become more efficient too. Like a combine is a combine. Your grain goes in the bin. Like you can still get it in the bin with an old combine, but if you get it done more efficiently, more productively with less labor and less fuel and makes you money, then you do it. So yeah, I would say a lot of the projects we work on is just trying to get things better, sort of like with our swap cam. It's like, well, you don't have to count plants anymore. Send a person driving around for a month counting a few plants subjectively, right? For the same amount of money, you can get every field done with thousands and thousands of images of field and objectively counted by a machine learning algorithm. There, now you've got something, right? So that's kind of the direction a lot of our products head. Well, and let, while we're on the topic, let's talk about kind of future products or future kind of evolutions of, of uh, the offerings you have. I don't know how much you want to tip your hand or what you're doing, but to the extent you do, um, what's coming next for Croptimistic? Um, we are releasing some things this year, so they don't, they don't need to be hidden. And typically here, one thing that we do is we typically use it internally for two years before something's released commercially to other service providers. And even at the tip of that, we usually work with some of our service providers that are willing to try new things um, and customers that are willing to try new things. So this year we're releasing the yield potential program. And so we've always been like swap maps are well known as it's a, it's a soils map. It's a map you sample soil for, it's a map you base your fertilizer and seed prescriptions on that are going in the soil or, you know, a soil amendment or a soil applied herbicide, that type of thing. Um, and this is be the first time we're building out what I call the full in-crop capability for precision egg. So you've got your SWAT cams to get your in-season crop and weed maps and plant stand counting. You've got imagery available for all your in-season prescriptive on-off variable rate fungicides or whatever you might use those for. And then the big, big part is the yield analytics. So analyze yield data and then relate it back to all the different factors throughout the year. So you can relate it to plant stands, you can relate it to soil test results by zone, and you can do nutrient use efficiencies and those types of things. So that's going to be released fully uh, commercial this year. I think there was approximately 300,000 acres on it last year before it was released. So you could say it's 
you know, been around a while before it's released. Another interesting release is internal RTK in our swap box. So previous to this, they're in areas that don't have LIDAR, which is elevations done with planes. Then they had to buy an RTK system and those would be, you know, 15 to 25 grand US. And our option is going to be less than 5,000. So that's another release. And on the SWAT certified that we've already mentioned, this is our first year we're releasing our own reports, SWAT sustainability reports. We have a corporate report that we're going to be releasing that people can read about our company. And um, farmers can also get it advanced for our report so that they can apply to government grants, go to their banks, et cetera. Um, that will be another release. So I guess we could go into the future beyond that, but those are a few of the items that are being released in 2024. Yeah. So are you, are you hearing on that SWAT certified? Are I, you must be hearing from, you know, growers and then also agronomists that look, we, uh, we we have all this data and we, we have people who are interested. We at governments or buyers or whoever the case may be, um, is there a way we just, I guess, provide a report to them where we don't have to do a bunch of work to, to aggregate it? Is that right? Yeah. I, I mean, it's the report gives you a nice hands-on thing that you can utilize yourself. Ideally, I mean, what you're looking for is somebody wants the, the data to validate it, but there's, it, it's such a massive breadbasket of items, right? Like it could be carbon, it could be you know, traceability platforms it could be so many different things that um, we're not necessarily going looking for those. What we're giving the reports for is to say, you find out who wants this stuff and we'll get connected and we'll get the value chain moving for you. So there's just too many things for us to go and do the work and connect up to some program. Like we've done this before. We've connected up to something and it went nowhere. So what's the point, right? Like where we would rather let's see who the winners are in the marketplace and maybe the farmers and the other service providers can help us find what those are. And it's easy for us to get connected after that. Well, you two, I've been around long enough to see all the points along the hype cycle of, of precision ag and ag tech. I mean, you've kind of seen the highest of the highs and probably the lowest of the lows, I would imagine. You know, where, where do you think we are today? How would you characterize where we are today in terms of precision agriculture? And uh, what does that look like, you know, going forward here? Derek, I'll let you start and then Corey can weigh in. Well, I'd say we're still very near the beginning. We're only a fairly small number of percentage of farmers have even variable rate equipment and a smaller percentage of that are using it properly, right? So I think as the tools get better and the equipment gets better, we'll see more and more uptake and we're just at the beginning. So I think that a lot of the stuff we're doing right now is to prove that variable rate works and will save uh, the farmer money and is in the end the better thing for the their fields and for the environment. So it's inevitable that variable rate will be done at a higher and higher resolution over time here. Yeah, my comment would be like that the core business that we're working in is probably like at the early majority stage. We're well past early adopter. I think we have like three and a half million acres used our, in ourselves that's retained and growing rapidly. And every piece of equipment that you buy now, uh, you know, planters, air drills, sprayers, they all come with this technology. So people are going to adopt it and it's it's sticking now. We're well past the point of, does this work? I mean, no, but having said that, there's still a massive amount of new tech that's coming out that would fit into that, you know, is it going to be in the market? So even some of our own products, like a SWAT cam, for example, I mean, like Derek mentioned, uh, we don't want to release products that may or may not get uptake in the market. Like it has to be a proven value proposition before you even go there. And that's the number one problem that's out there right now is just, I mean, we started a few years ago, I was all excited about APIs and data connections and working with all different companies. And most of that didn't really add into any value. Didn't add into value for the farmer, didn't really bring any value for us 
took more time and resources to maintain and cost money. And it was like, well, I mean, we're, we're just going to do what we do. We're just going to focus on our, our own things that we do. So I, I think in general, I think we've stepped back to almost like some of the farmers have. Doesn't mean we've stepped back on building new technology or doing more things in the precision ag space because we haven't. But now it's like, I think everyone in general is more bring me something that's been proven for a while and then we'll talk, including us. And we're in the ag tech space, right? Now my excitement about people coming up, I'm, you get 10 new people trying to link up with you every day on LinkedIn with some startup, but my interest is pretty low. It's like, you know, it's you got to have some kind of value proposition. So I think that's kind of where I feel it's at. Yeah. I mean, that's an interesting comment about APIs. It definitely has been consistent with a lot of things I've seen, which is like, it's not that people don't want to collaborate, but like collaborating for collaboration's sake is, you know, very time and resource consuming and doesn't provide any real value uh, to anyone. You know, what do you think is the holdup there? If you have two different companies all trying to provide value and think like, wouldn't it be better together? Uh, it just never seems to work. And I'm, I'm just curious of what you've learned along the way that's made you realize why that might be. Some of the APIs are really limited in what you can push and pull from them, right? So it's like, I don't want to name names, but certain ones that we've API'd to, you, we could push more data in better formats or higher resolution, but you really can't. And we would pull more data, but you really can't. So that really limits what you can do. Sometimes there's just data overload too. Like everybody has lots of data, but unless you can compile it into a nice report or into some sort of a, a product that uses that data, then it's, it's less useful. Yeah. As far as like, like connections are two things there. We talk about connecting data, but if you're connecting operational business, so, I mean, if, if you're going to connect to one provider to pull yield data, but you can't, you don't connect to the five others that are out there. Well, it's not really that useful for a service provider, right? Like, because then they still have to do 80% of the work the old way, 20% of it's easier. So does it really solve a big problem? So lots of the things are like that. I find with these data connections in general is that you have now you have another relationship to manage and it better solve the whole problem. And I think um, as Derek alluded to, lots of the times you still don't have everything you need, right? So I can send a swap map to their platform, but they can't do anything with it. It's just an image over there. So what good is it? Nice picture. And at the end of the day, like what are, what's our business? Like we're trying to be in the business to give the farmer what he needs. Like the farmers could care less how they get to that point. If you've got a hundred APIs or you have zero, they just want you to show up. All the work is done. Here's all the relationships. Here's what our plan is. And Here's your prescriptions and go do it. And they work and they're happy. That's all they want. They just want the outcome. So we started realizing like a lot of these things were just making more work for ourselves. And talking to service providers and farmers are like, just make your own product better. Like you got a hundred list of a hundred things that you could make your own product better without spending time spinning your wheels, trying to integrate other people's products. As long as we can get the data in, it's, even if it's just exported, it's good enough. We don't need some beautiful flowing data train to get what we need. So maybe some other companies do. They need the data flowing to them, but we're not one of those companies, really. The resolution that we have data to is higher than a lot of the systems we're pushing data to, right? So we, for instance, know the yield by zone, right? Which is a lot more information than, you know, a third party system where we're just pushing, you know, the average yield for the field to or something. So it can feel a little bit coarse when we're throwing away 90% of our data, when we're pushing data to other systems, or we're only pulling in like a, a field average yield or something when we really want it at a higher resolution. Yeah, it makes sense. Well, let's uh, look forward here a little bit. If, if I'm a farmer listening and I feel like I have a good sense of where Precision Ag is today, Give us a sense of where it might be in the future, maybe 20 years from now. And, and I, I know, you know, I'm asking you to see the future here, which is pretty hard to do. But uh, if you could dream a little bit about where, where Precision Ag could be for me as a, as a hypothetical farmer in this case, uh, what might things look like in the future? Well, 
because our vision is to be the global leader in premium precision agriculture services. So obviously that tells a few things. One thing is that we believe there's a premium market, right? There's different layers within this market. We believe that we're targeting premium. We believe people want premium. Like in the tech side with farmers, I really feel like, sure, people will use more and more tech, but but they're not going to be the ones utilizing it. Farmers aren't going to be out there doing all this stuff. They're going to hire a service provider. It's too complicated. Sometimes it's even too complicated for our service providers. The training programs we have to people to do fundamental things. So that's the first step is that we're premium. We're as, about as hands off as you can get. That's the vision we have. So I can't talk to the whole industry because some people will be exactly another side and want to be the Walmart where it's just like there's no service provider. And you just show up and, you know, cash and carry and get what you want. But I believe that's a very small market. Just from the amount of time we've worked in this market, I would say 98% of farmers are using a service provider to do precision egg services. They're not doing it themselves. So that's, I still see that as staying as part of the equation. And so then the other part of it is like the service side, right? I feel like that's the strength of our business. And that's why the retention is so high. We are year over year measurable retention of 98% on acres. Why is that? Because there's always somebody involved, right? The buck stops here. Like we're hired to make this stuff work. So if something doesn't work, it's our job to know and fix it. And that never happens again. So whether it's our support portals or our training programs or you know, building out better software solutions to minimize errors and those types of things. So that's going to be really important. Now, I can look into the future and say precision spraying. Yeah, we're not in that business, but that's going to happen. It's pretty obvious. We have that SWAT cam ourselves. We know that it's going to identify weeds and you can do amazing things with that. So I see that as definitely is going to happen. Derek and I are also working on like precision soil sampling. In the future, we'll be driving around with trucks, punching dirt with probes and sending dirt to labs and waiting a week. And no, I don't believe so. I think it's 10 years away because we're working heavily on that, investing in that as well. It's going to take a long time to get all that technology developed that works and integrates well. So that's what I see good promise in. Drones are coming along, but... It, I still see it as the high value market, personally. And we're not in that market so much, like fruits and nuts and, you know, orchards and vegetable crops and, you know, very high value crops. Where I, That's where I see that, you know, small scale farming. I don't see drones being heavily used in 10 to 20 years. Now, having said that, I see there's some very good technology out there, but I just don't know how you're going to displace a sprayer that can see and spray and you have one person servicing themselves, you know, on a farm of 10,000 acres, which happens today. I just don't see you have some geek running around with 20 drones and trying to keep all this stuff working. Like my experience with it is it's, it's just not for that purpose. So, I mean, that's a few insights, I guess, that I would add. That was great. Derek? Yeah, from our perspective, I think we're going to see higher resolution of variable rate. So we're going to be managing the field in smaller zones and we're going to have better information about what nutrients are there much better estimates about what can grow based on the soil properties and on the nutrients that we add so we'll be able to do a much better optimization at a you know a pixel level like a very small tight grid uh, throughout the field to optimize profit based on all those factors and as equipment improves we're going to be able to do things like hopefully variable depth seeding i think you'll see more and more intercropping mixing of varieties to try to optimize stuff like plant stand evenness and maturity try to get the crops to mature more evenly improve quality so we're going to be optimizing on a lot more things than just yield i think that that yield sometimes is the 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 measurable but we're also really looking to optimize quality and profitability while reducing inputs. Great guys. Well, I, I really appreciate all this. I think just one last question for both of you is you, know, you guys have been at this a long time. You've seen a lot of things. What continues to keep you 
motivated to keep charging forward? I mean, what, when you wake up, what kind of gets you fired up to hit the ground running every day? Derek, you want to start this one? Well, I, I just see the potential. Like I still feel like on the software side, we're just barely scraping the surface on what can be done as far as the farmer knowing what's going on in their field and being able to apply more accurately, better prescriptions. So our wish list of features to build is always like three years, five years long. So there's never shortage of exciting things to build. We have lots of people that are anxious to get those new features used and in the field right away. So that always keeps me going. Yeah, I think that we're a very passionate group. I feel our, our staff are all very passionate too. So it's enjoyable to go to work every day. And I think last year, the success now, like I, we very, very close to adding 1 million new acres that were swap mapped last year. And then the calculated 98% retention rate so like the growth that we're seeing now and the stickiness of the product and the new products that we got coming and the advancements that Derek's team are, you know, building out in the software as far as like getting it more functional and operational just feels like we've, we've gone away from what, what we dreamed of doing to what we are doing. And now it's just like, it's more of like the operating environment that we live in now. And it's fun because we were both there right from the beginning. Right. When it was a dream, when you dreamed of building a company and read about it and listen to podcasts like the Future of Egg podcast, trying to see would learn from other people. And now, you know, we're one of those people. So, yeah, it's just very fulfilling for us. And I, I know our staff and farmers are enjoying it as well. So you know, and you got to be making money like at the end of the day. I mean, something people don't like to talk about, but, you know. There's a profit in it for us. There's a profit for our customers. And when that happens, business is good. So, Well, I really enjoyed that interview with Corey and Derek. I hope you did too. There's so many nuggets in there, whether you are an agronomist or crop consultant or a farmer interested in precision ag technology or someone interested in building an ag tech company. There are so many takeaways there from both Derek and from Corey. Really enjoyed that one. Uh, I do also encourage you to go back and listen to 211 or re-listen if you've been with me a long time because uh, there's a lot of good stuff in that episode as well. These two go very well together. And go check them out online at Swap maps.com not just because they are a quarterly presenting sponsor although thank you very much Corey and derek and team for that but also uh because this is just a, in my mind uh someone who's very much doing it right bringing innovation to the farm in a way where everyone benefits to that last point you know they have to make money the farmer has to make money the crop consultant or advisor has to make money and and that is a perfect example of how value should be shared uh among this innovative technology that's really moving agriculture forward so thanks again to Corey and derek thank you so much for listening for your time and your attention i never take it lightly i'll be back next week with another story of ag innovation